in that domain. Uh, she's uh, Los Angeles based. She's a journalist in architecture. She's published widely from the New York Times uh, to Dwell, Architect, etc. Uh, she was a, she's an editor and uh, publisher of Loud Paper, which is a zine and blog uh, dedicated to increasing the volume of architectural discourse. I like that. Uh, now, I don't know how to pronounce that. Ling Ling? Something like that. Ling Ling. She's the founding member of Ling Ling. Or LGN LGN. LGN LGN. Which is a think tank, think, on, uh, think tank on architecture and publishing. And she's adjunct faculty uh, in the Media Design Practice MFA at the Art Center. She was before director of communications at the Woodbury School of Architecture. So she's really a key figure in uh, how to construct and disseminate uh, architectural discourse throughout a series of platforms from traditional print to the most advanced uh, digital media. So tonight she will talk about that topic, presumably, right? Memos from the front line. So please welcome me, Zaya. Can you hear me okay? All right. Thank you, Jean-Francois, and Michael Speaks for bringing me here, and lovely to see all your faces. Um, I'm going to start, I've got the screen going. Ooh. I'm not getting a screen view, which would be helpful. Just tap the screen. Okay. There we go. Uh, for someone who's so enmeshed in digital, I'm at the moment having technical difficulties now. Um, so I've entitled kind of cheekily uh, this body of work that I'm going to show tonight, uh, Memos from the Front Line. It's a quote from Dick Hebridge um, from his book, Subculture, The Meaning of Style, and it's how he describes punk rock zines. Um, and I really love sort of the implicit mashup of the corporate with the, with, with the militaristic, with the, um, with, the, with the agenda. And in a way, the kind of work that slips between different platforms, between print and digital, is the intersection of really what I do. Uh, and I do it in all sorts of different ways for different people with different collaborators. Um, so I'm going to show you some of that work. Uh, and then I'm going to show you sort of a recent um, theoretical position I've taken on criticism. And we can sort of then pull that into a larger discussion. So we're at a time where the intersection of print and digital media is really rich with potential. I mean, we've all been talking sort of about Instagramming and tweeting today. Um, however, the declarations that the web has killed the book um, is really more complicated than it looks. There is, you know, the print is dead attitude. Uh, we've sort of established that there is still a, a real investigation into print. So I'm going to show a few projects uh, that talk about how we navigate that. But first, I have to go back in time a little bit. So in 1997, while I was a graduate student at SciArc, um, I founded the zine Loud Paper. And I founded it with the following statement. And you. Uh, this is the original sort of call for submissions um, done on a, uh, some ledger paper I had found at a thrift shop. This is kind of the, the moment we were in. It's the hi-fi at the bottom was to sort of talk about the lo-fi nature of, uh, of the material that we were producing. Loud paper is open to all students, architects, educators, Girls About Town, Dear Johns, and Critics as a place for writing loud about architecture and culture. The hard copy issues of Loud Paper carved out an activist space for architectural dialogue. And in its pages, um, more than 70 people from across the globe participated. Um, writers, artists, musicians, architects, graphic designers, illustrators, and editors. The involvement of so many committed people, all volunteering their time, uh, made it into a collective rather than individual enterprise. Uh, we made 13 issues in total. 
Um, and I say we because it was my project, but then I, over the course of it, the number of collaborators I had sort of began to build, and so it became a collective effort. Um, so it had initially a Xerox staple and fold production. Um, and in a way, loud paper can be considered a uh, proto blog. It's a speedy, speedy in a pre web page free for all landscape. And the fanzine, with its fold and staple craftsmanship, I would say was a space for acting out politics and identity. For me, it was a way of creating a space to talk differently about architecture. So I had an agenda to talk about where the intersection of architecture, pop culture, music, all was kind of colliding. And by making my own zine, I was able to do that. Stephen Duncombe uh, writes in his book from around that time, uh, the book is called Notes from the Underground, Zines and the Politics of Alternative Culture, says, in an era marked by the rapid centralization of corporate media, zines are independent and localized, coming out of cities, suburbs, and small towns across the USA. Assembled on kitchen tables, they celebrate the every person in a world of celebrity, losers in a society that rewards the best and the brightest. Zinesters privilege the ethic of DIY, do it yourself, make your own culture and stop consuming, that's what's made for you. I think that still resonates, yet it's complicated by sort of the fact of the web where we end up in a long tail situation where sort of everything is niche with the potential to go viral. So you never know if something is going to sort of hit or not and everyone competes for that. So, um, in 2009, Duncombe, sort of in a panel discussion around a, uh, a show I did around zine culture, he said, alternative culture, which zine culture represented, is totally absorbed in the web. So I want to see, like, how, how do you disrupt this absorption? How do you use the ubiquity of web culture for other means? And I suggest a few ideas to make it happen. Um, but first, I want to show you a little video, and then I'll tell you about it. Sorry about this, guys. The music's nice, though. <laughs> I did. It's it taking its time to run off the desktop. Took it off the jump drive, yeah. so it doesn't have it. No, it shouldn't. Wait, did you put the? Uh, did you pull the source file? On? I so you don't have to download it. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Because the jump, jump drive is still on there. Yes. I can't seem to get down to. Oh, here we go. Be in the PowerPoint in the jump drive. Is that going to work? Yes. Yes. As long as you have the source file. Do you have the video source file in there? I have no idea. I think I, I can pull off the web though. <laughs> Sorry, guys. I'll get a new tab.
All right, now you guys are really sick of this music. It's never gonna pay off. Is it worth it? Okay. Um, where do I go to get back to my pop up? Oh, let's just hang out there for a second. Um, right. Thank you. Um, so I wanted. The piece is Maxima Maxim, Maxim, MMX, which I created for um, a one minute cabaret at the Storefront Park um, Architecture uh, in 2010. Um, I was asked to sort of make something that represented an exhibition on zines that I had created a couple of years before. And at the time, the conversation about whether printed was dead or whether even the web was dead um, especially as uh, magazines were folding rapidly, publishing houses were closing, and you know, the, even the like nature of the New York Times was in jeopardy. So I started it um, from the quote by Oscar Wilde, in the old days, books were written by men of letters and read by the public. Now books are written by the public and read by nobody. So Maximum Maxim was produced you know, when the web was being eulogized and sort of we were beginning to get sort of sentimental Victor Hugo kinds of things like the book has killed the building, um, you know, these sort of the ends of things were always um, coming up, even though we were enmeshed in something that and still are enmeshed in sort of a question that hasn't been resolved. So I decided to look at the aphorism. Uh, as, a, as a way to sort of capture um, sort of the kinds of things that get thrown out there during sort of periods of crisis or even um, just as sort of, as sort of stand-ins or sort of signifiers for sort of larger meanings. Um, so the popularity of the uh, a aphorism, uh, which is a short, memorable, often pithy statement, goes in hand in hand with the invention of printing. And throughout the 18th, 19th, and 20th centuries, Aphorisms and maxims were published globally in like thick bound collections. And although print remains precarious in a digital age, the aphoristic statement lives on, and you'll see that sort of through Twitters and memes these days. Um, I like them because they left them sort of non attributed, even though I think some of you can sort of guess at the authors, um, because many of these have become free floating. Um, signifiers that are free of their context and kind of free of meaning so that in architecture we sort of have these things that we're supposed to be grabbing onto but they sort of float away. Um, another example of this would be, um, oh, so I just, this is just, we're going to be looking at three things, pastiche, blue lobsters, collective criticism um, and we're in our pastiche moment and I'll just slide out of order there. So, this is a, a piece that I did for issue five of the zine Junk Chat, the pretty, uh, pretty brilliant architecture zine. And this was their uh, web issue. They publish all their issues in GIFs um, so that you can read them quickly on the web. No, just, they just do that because. Um, the piece I did for this um, used a quote um, from, uh, that is usually attributed to Yogi, Yogi Berra but it's sometimes uh, a 
attributed to Paul Valeray, um, which is the future is not used to be. And I aggregated that quote by sort of Googling the future is, and then found sort of all of these different, or the future isn't, and all these sort of different things that the future isn't and brought them together into a single text. Um, other kinds of projects um, sort of also deal with sort of the unattributed. Um, it's part of network culture. It's where uh, you know, authorship and aura disappears, and it's where things like, um, as the New Yorker cartoon says, uh, on the web, no one knows you're a dog. So the internet culture makes flat um, uh, everything. So there is no more subcultures. Everything sort of exists on a single plane, and data mining begins to sort of bring things up to the surface. Another project I worked on with uh, John Southern, and I co-edited this uh, catalog. It's an exhibition catalog to unfinished business, which is the um, an exhibition that the LA Forum for Architecture and Urban Design in Los Angeles, which I'm co-president of, um, that uh, we did a couple years ago to celebrate the 25th uh, anniversary of the, uh, of the forum. Uh, and we had these boxes of paper archives that we needed to go to and somehow represent. And so what we did is we culled quotes from 25 years of newsletters and began to put them in one place. So they became uh, somewhat aphoristic in themselves. And so the archive could almost exist as this very ephemeral, very large piece of newsprint. Of course, you have to, in LA, you have to take pictures of things on the back of your car if it's required. So from there, because we're sort of talking at the intersection of print and digital, I want to move on to something I call blue lobsters. Um, you know, has Twitter, Tumblr, and Pinterest killed the blog, book, and the building? That's 83 characters for those who are tweeting. Um, as go buildings, go as so go design magazines, and the past few years has seen sort of shelter magazines stumble and sort of reframe themselves. Um, and trade titles sort of fold under the dead weight of slow building starts and, you know, curtailed ad revenue. As such, little magazines um, have been emerging and are collected. Their presence tends to lead uh, to a single polar standoff, print versus digital, but dividing publishing into two camps leads us empty-handed. So I look at sort of what falls in between. I'm tempted to call these new publications zombies, following Todd Gannon's assessment in Log in 2008 of Archigram, our favorite little zinesters, um, and other 60s practitioners um, whose unbuilt work persists in its influence um, after facing a critical death, which it did, and now has been sort of reborn. Um, especially since those groups' publications provide the emotional, if not intellectual or formal, underpinnings of today's self-publishing efforts, or as Todd puts it in the essay, the return of the living dead archogram and architecture's monstrous media, quote, nine and one half eponymous pamphlets released from 1961 to 1974, archogram took advantage of the highly reconfigurable space of the printed page to manipulate forms, juxtapose elements, orchestrate architectural experiments uh, impossible in other media. But given that experiments in other media could now be taken to define much of architectural practice, I prefer to call these half-breeds mutants. Living between paper and screen, mutants are part of, a pub of publishing's evolution, even if a specific characteristic proves too wieldly to pass on to the next generation. A blue lobster is a mutant lobster. This is the last, I showed you the first 12 issues of Loud Paper. This is the last uh, 13th issue of Loud Paper. Um, it was published as half catalog, half zine. Um, it's a broadsheet designed by a longtime collaborator of mine named Chris Grimley. Um, you probably can't tell from the photograph, but in its large size, it is, 
it takes up a huge amount of space, so it makes physical sort of the presence of the pu publishing effort, so it sort of expands itself. This is us on the subway. Um, but even more important, the column size of, of the text was exactly the same size as the column text on the blog. So we're sort of reproducing a digital form in sort of uh, in analog. Um, this project is a collaborative project that I did um, under the auspices of Leagues and Legions, or LGN, LGN. This is the New City Reader. It's a performance-based editorial residency that was at the New Museum. It was created by Joseph Grima and Kaziz Farnellis as part of the last newspaper show that ran at the New Museum in October 2010 to, to January 2011. Um, they asked different groups to come in on a weekly basis and to publish an edition. Um, so Leagues and Legions came in and uh, we were given the classified section, which if you know anything about newspapers these days, that you, you know, they, they're completely dri dried up. And, but the classifieds used to be what drove sort of the income, especially of like weekly papers, like something like the Village Voice. So for us, it, the idea of doing a classified section was to deal with loss and longing in the city. Um, the auspices of the New City Reader was that this print item couldn't actually be read until it was put on a wall and then it had to be sort of, you know, installed in public space in order to have full legibility. So there was sort of this wonderful sort of mashup between sort of the intimacy of the classified and the publicness of uh, the um, display. So, of course we had to slip in sort of a digital platform into this. So, in investigating the role of aggregated co content, we decided we'd use a Google Doc in order for people to submit their classifieds. Now, the exchange here, like, and this is sort of like how you give your content to Facebook, you know, you give all your personal information. In exchange, you get to use the platform. Here, we asked some very personal questions. In exchange, you got a free classified in something that was in an art, you know, art show. Um, so if personal information replicates cash in a networked economy, then how much are you willing to exchange um, for a new city reader classified, we asked. Um, Leagues and Legions sets out to map longing, desire, guilt, and regret in the city, as well as the city's losses and desires through the classified section. Answer a few personal questions and we'll publish your wants and needs, lost and founds, misconnections, and notices. So we were asking for things like, you know, where would you meet someone for a date? Um, have you ever signed up for a um, for personals? Um, what have what have you lost? And then they were able to sort of say what section they wanted it in. So for sale, lost and found, seeking relationships, mixed connections. In order to sort of aggregate some of this content, we also did an exhibition up in Boston called Newsstand. Um, this is some of the pieces that we had in it, and then. For the catalog for newsstand, we also asked people to fill out a classified ad in order to take a catalog. And here it is in its entirety, uh, beautifully designed by uh, Neil Donnelly. And there's the whole thing online. So you can see that we had um, the middle sort of blobby piece is a whole mapping via V um, Craigslist of sort of different call words in the city and where they came from. The sort of running text is uh, uh, all the classifieds that we brought in, but then we also had advice column, a, um, all the things you would find in sort of the uh, disposable part of the newspaper, the uh, classified section, a um, crossword puzzle, uh, and then a hand-drawn back page of the Village Voice. Um, just another sort of quick project that I, I didn't even know I was part of until I was part of it. Um, this is the catalog for um, the Istanbul Biennale, um, where in order to make their catalog, they pulled content from the web and printed it. Um, so this is an essay that I wrote for the BMW Guggenheim blog um, on uh, open source computing uh, and the city. 
And here, and then it becomes laid out in print and translated into Turkish, um, the sort of conventions of the web in terms of like the blue highlighting and a set of window boxes on top of it get laid over it. And here it is in Turkish. Um, now, Platform Project is something that I am deeply involved in. I've sort of run two summers at um, SVH Decrit. Um, it is a, a design writing intensive where the students are asked to use Twitter as their primary source of writing in my class. They write essays and stuff in other people's class. Um, I work with, again, with Neil Donnelly, the designer on it, um, in order to create uh, this product, which is um, a collection of and cur a curated collection of tweets based on a series of assignments that were then sort of algorithmically uh, designed in, into this. And what I mean by that is we had sort of four different categories um, plus, you know, four different criteria um, in mashing up sort of the criteria to the categories, um, which would be something like date, time of day versus or is something narrative, is it critique, is it a profile? Um, we began to sort of change the paper stock color, change whether it's black or white, change the font. And so that, that's how so this became something. So over the two weeks, uh, we created a thousand tweets, um, which we brought 68 into the, uh, into the publication. Um, this translation of the stream of the internet into a distilled interaction between the reader and the tweet. Um, and then we moved, these things as little handbills um, out into the city um, became sort of a commentary on sort of the fluidity of sort of what we write in the city on our devices, sort of, and then kind of filtered through a curatorial ambition and then sort of put back out into the city, which of course these were then photographed and retweeted um, as, as the Hugo. Um, the following year we did one where we did something very similar in terms of the assignment, but the outcome was different. It was a website that we developed based on the similar kind of themes of algorithms. You can read some of these. Uh, and then we projected them into the windows of 21st Street outside of Decrit. Again, sort of changing scale between sort of what is sort of a light missive that sort of runs on a network to something that is more billboard in form and sort of acts to, you know, to sort of engage a viewer from the, you know, the street below, sort of very uh, randomly. There's, some, there's the students, they couldn't help themselves. Um, and this is a more recent piece I did on Twitter. It's a collective criticism workshop called uh, Reread Remix. Um, it's a cross-platform workshop that um, explores the act of critical writing as it translates from the page to the screen to performance. So if before we were going from page to screen to the city, um, here this is sort of what happens page to screen to sort of physicalizing this. Um, the workshop questioned the role of the critic in a digital age and it cautiously embraced the potential of the social web and posits a collective criticism as a product mode, a productive mode for expanding discourse. Prior to the workshop, the participants were asked to read and respond in a public manner, public meaning via Twitter, um, to uh, Ada Louise Huxtable's Plastic Flowers Are Almost All Right, uh, where she claims a kind of a marvelous ambivalence to the work of the Venturis. Um, in uh, 1971, it's sort of a pivotal moment to sort of look at and sort of see that everything that is pop was not necessarily sort of either vilified or um, or celebrated as kind of right now we're now we celebrate it, but you know, there were these sort of critical moments of tensions around it. Um, and then also Rainer Banham's uh, Bricolage à Lanterne, um, and also uh, they were asked to look at Charles Jenks and Nathan Silver's ad hocism which again was looking at these moments where um, things like the DIY or sort of the popular were being kind of mashed up with, um, with architecture. Uh, Banham actually sort of makes a critique of ad hocism and, um, and sort of the, uh, sort of the leaving out of the technical, leaving out of the engineer. So in working in groups, the students made critical commentary using the 140 character limit of Twitter on the, 
and the texts on the discussion, uh, we workshopped them, and then they were asked to read three to five of their tweets and perform them in rapid succession. Critic operates at a minimal distance towards society and shows the gaps in its discourses. Hashtag be reasonable. Craft in architecture, craft in criticism. What sort of craft does Twitter inspire? Hashtag be reasonable. The floating perspective of criticism mirrors the position of fantasy to be present at the site of your own absence. Hashtag be reasonable. It is the gift and burden of the hashtag critic to see patterns and systems of history. At Ali Karimi, architectural publications are becoming cheerleading rather than criticism. At Dan Koff, quote, why Zaha's form, why not a duck, end quote. Hashtag spaghetti versus duck, hashtag free reading. Lamenting what is lost in a culture which forgets quickly Today's invention in any field will be tomorrow's most iconic nostalgia. Hashtag rewriting, hashtag rereading. Our Venturi and Scott Brown's ideas on signage whittled even sharper upon impact with the digital age. At Architectural Critics, you don't know my struggle. Hashtag reread. There is never enough time to hashtag reread the hashtag rereading. I hashtag reread to jumble, to tamper with ideas thrown out into the air because they are mine. A critic is a distorted mirror. Clarity can be just as polemical. Hashtag rereading at Irene Chen, I'm reminded of the need to choose your words wisely to make a change. Critics, observers, documenters, listeners, analysts, lists, voyeurs, philosophers, devil's advocates, hashtag rereading. We'll stop it there. Um, so I think this, this piece, which is about sort of what happens when you begin to sort of read aloud the stuff that we make digital? And so how does it begin to sort of resonate again when we sort of put it in this kind of uh, video form? And sort of where, where are sort of um, the hiccups uh, and sort of conventions are sort of made live? Um, it, it's really interesting. And I think it becomes sort of the live performance of another kind of work I want to talk about whenever I figure out how to, you know, do this thing. So, which is collective criticism. So, to talk about these things as emerging or emerged platforms, a kind of collective criticism, we have to start here. Um, we have to start here with the meme uh, ferocious forms because it really wouldn't be right if I started here um, with the meme uh, Ryan Gosling architecture in 2012. Um, which in the tradition of Tumblr memes mashes up the culturally high with the culturally low creating a Photoshop tone poem that answers to its own internal logic. So we have to go back to the cats. Um, Ferocious Forms, which took off in 2011, is architecture plus lol cats. Um, and we all know that cats are what the internet is made for. Um, these images are collected on a single site and produced by multiple authors around the same theme, kitty plus building. The Tumblr is anonymous and the images are gathered through open submission, so it is a collective form. I like this meme for a couple of reasons. One, um, it's in the tradition of collage as critique, 
not unlike Stanley Tigerman's The Titanic, which in sinking Mises Crown Hall at IIT makes commentary on the changing role of modernist pedagogy in Chicago and elsewhere. So if Tigerman's Titanic lets us know that Mies is no longer king of the world, then what do lolcats tell us? Perhaps that there is critical backlash to the steady stream of images available online. The introduction of a cat into the production of iconic imagery creates a detournement, a point of resistance that disturbs the consumption of architectural imagery. However, I'm really interested in how these images are aggregated together, and you can sort of see my love of aggregation from before, um, that individual actions aggregate into a single meme. In 2010, Clay Shirky, um, a digital culture critic, dubbed this activity cognitive surplus in a book of the same name. And his premise was that the internet harnesses creative energy, where Amer Americans once spent millions of hours collectively watching television, that spare time is now put into interaction online, engagement rather than consumption. His cognitive surplus theory gained traction with Arab Spring protests documented on Twitter, to what degree that can be argued, but, and with um, Occupy Wall Street in 2011. And for that, um, and then that I mean that the uh, sort of people were looking to sort of his, his theory in order to explain sort of the birth of sort of a kind of online activism. Um, I like to show this image from fall 2011 Occupy protest at UC Berkeley. Um, and this is because architecture students came up with the idea to fill tents with balloons and float them over Sprawl Plaza, since tents themselves were banned from the ground. Um, for me, it's a moment which, trade, which was extensively traded on Twitter, where the tent uh, was transformed from a functional object on the ground um, to a symbol of protest. It became, if you, you know, bear with me, a lull tent. So I'm interested in Twitter not for the oft-touted democracy of social media, but because when we apply Shirky's cognitive surplus to criticism, something really exciting happens. The crisis of the death of criticism that was sort of echoing through, you know, sort of the halls of architecture schools um, is, and the devaluing of the authority of a single critic is replaced by an expanded platform of the social web, which leverages the power of a networked public sphere. For this, I suggest the term collective criticism. And collective criticism is born of the social web. It operates on, across, and between platforms, which means it can go from Facebook to Twitter to Instagram sort of seamlessly. It's made up of individuals, but takes its power from responsive dialogue, not autonomous authorship. Collective criticism opens up the possibility of many criticisms rather than a single dominant discourse. And it's true that the overused term uh, truism, everyone's a critic, holds only minor sway when applied to the individual, but it gains strength when understood collectively. So who are collective critics? They're us, they're influencers and audience sort of simultaneously. Collective criticism bears resemblance to crowdsourced journalism where distributed citizen journalists contribute to news stories via online tools and in doing so turn reporting into a model of aggregated production. Like crowdsourcing, it draws on expert and amateur sources, but collective criticism isn't after neutral or seamless outcomes that categorize journalism. Instead, there's an emphasis on extended research, dialogic critique, and debate. So to illustrate this, I want to show um, a discussion and debate regarding the aestheticization of poverty by architects from mid-August. Um, without going into too much of the content on here, um, I just want to sort of track sort of the series of social media that happened. It started with a tweet from Nick Axel uh, regarding a post on the mainstream design blog Design Boom, and then translated into a Facebook post you see here, uh, in which um, Ethel Barona Pohl uh, was 
making a sort of a commentary on sort of whether or not uh, this is an appropriate use. It was a, uh, a an image of a slum uh, that had then been sort of turned into a architecture project and then put up as sort of a slick representation on a design blog. Um, the Facebook post then culminated into two blog posts. Um, one on the DPR Barcelona site and one on Leopold Lampert's fund Fundabilist site. And with each iteration and switching a platform, the content was extended. And you can see here sort of the comment stream that began to sort of appear off of this. These are all sort of people sort of weighing in on sort of the ethics and uh, of, of the, the, the piece and sort of created this like longer criticism and sort of in-depth dialogue around whether or not we you know, can be repurposing these kinds of sort of actions in the city. So if there's a symbol for collective criticism, it's the hashtag. Um, if there's a symbol that strives to bring meaning to the global network, um, it's the hashtag. It's digitally ubiquitous on Twitter and Instagram, and the symbol holds the distinct power to convene a commons. And here we can see it in action with both mama. Um, while fail, hashtag fail, and hashtag winning dominate the trend wars on Twitter, the platform offers the possibility for collective critical discourse. And this past spring, um, the Folk MoMA served as a rallying cry across the internet, bringing together writers and designers in protest of MoMA's decision to demolish the American Folk Art Museum. Folk MoMA founders and sort of the founders of the hashtag, um, Anna Maria de Leon and Killian Riano used Twitter at Folk MoMA to foment this activism. And it has been sort of restarted now that we have this past week, the um, the, the proposal by Dolores Graffiti of Renfro to demolish the museum and sort of the really vocal commentary that has sort of come after it. So we can see that the, uh, the crux of Folk MoMA lies with the power of the hashtag. And you can see that here, um, which uh, was in the Architects newspaper in May where um, editor Alan Brake writes, sensing a renewed spirit of engagement and activism around equality, urbanism, architecture, and education. Exciting. Uh, Folk MoMA, Free Cooper. Sadly, both of those are kind of not happening now. Um, but what I want to show really is sort of what has happened since around that hashtag. will come up. But this is a story file that was created by Architect Magazine um, as sort of various, uh, as the announcement of, um, of the, demo, of the you know, planned demolition uh, started to go around the web. I think what's really interesting about this is that they, in using Storify, they began to sort of pull together all the tweets of the different uh, critics. So we have Kimmelman, John King out of San Francisco, Mark Lamster out of Dallas, Alexander Lang, Paul Goldberger, myself, you know, various people beginning to weigh in. And they clearly sort of were pulling, here's Carrie Jacobs, they were pulling sort of from people who write pu very publicly about architecture and, um, and, you know, sort of in media. However, if we go, To this one, you know, we have a full kind of collective criticism moment happening where we have um, Chthonic, which is uh, the critic Philip Nobel and Chris Hawthorne, um, in conversation with the architect Andy Bernheimer, and that they are debating here in multiple tweets, and you can see all sorts of different people beginning to weigh in. The, whether or not the architects have the responsibility and what kind of ethics should be applied to this kind of demolition or and sort of plans to raise. So I think, and you can, it's sort of extensive, it brings in lots of people, it sort of keeps going. Um, 
But I, I think I bring that up and I'm going to close here because I think this means that we're sort of occupying a space of time where we can continue to have dialogues and we, that the authority of the single critic is really only as good as sort of the dialogue that happens around it. And so with Folk Mama, we've actually seen every critic sort of give their two cents on it, but actually some of the most interesting and productive work around sort of what it means in the larger architectural discourse is happening in places like, uh, like Twitter. So with that, um, I will close and uh, thank you very much. <laughs>take it back to zine culture sort of that was sort of the ultimate unpaid labor right that you did that sort of on the cheap you know as as much as you can and if we sort of take a corollary to sort of twitter um i i see it as participatory um it does not no it it has it it has no sort of um cost value to it um but i think the value the value that it adds to sort of not allowing sort of certain kinds of discourses to sort of be singular um, and, and ways that they sort of sometimes can, sort of very channelized, very hierarchical. Um, I think that we have to be able to sort of va value that. Even, and no, it's it, the, the sort of, what you will get in return in payment is um, never very high, although uh, I suppose you could sell you some of the tweets um, if you were like, if, you, if you're, you're one of the fancy peoples. Um, but yeah, you will never get right, rich writing um, in, in, sort of in this culture. That, so it's sort of, in that sense, valueless and, and valuable at the same time. I know that didn't quite answer it, but yeah.
how can we actually start to assume, especially in an architectural school environment, how do we start to create a base knowledge, a collective knowledge, where you need to read this, 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 and this, and accompaniment to you know, the current you know, Twitter updates? Because mm -hmm. I think that collective criticism is a really important thing. I mean, I troll on Reddit constantly, and it's Reddit's one of the most amazing online platforms because I never actually go to the New York Times. I let someone else tell me when, when mm -hmm. I need to go and precisely what I need to look at. And it starts to become this sign signifier relationship of I don't actually know what websites I'm going to go to. I, I don't know most of the publications mm -hmm. I go to at this point. But the fact is, you know, how can you determine which ones are you supposed to go to at that point? How do you kind of pull out of the, you know, the floating signifiers that the internet has turned into and start to determine, especially in architectural education, this is what you do. So are you looking for a canon? Is that sort of the, what the is, is that the narrative of loss I'm hearing? Is that there, there is a certain body of work which we should read or you know, have to read in order to understand? I guess the question is twofold. What is the canon, if any? Mm -hmm. I mean, the canon, the canon I see is constantly being rewritten and so that it sort of has sort of frittered away at its edges and we can talk about whether or not that's a good thing or a bad thing. I think lots of new things have been able to sort of add sort of larger context to the canon. But my interest is, and this is gonna sound like another sort of, you know, sort of dodge, um, but architecture, education, and sort of the syllabi that accompany it um, is its own thing. And I, I'm not necessarily convinced that this kind of thing, which is about sort of discursive, about the writings, about the sort of dialogues around architecture, is necessarily meant to sort of serve as a sort of replacement for the canon. Um, but it, it can sort of begin to sort of add other kinds of texts, other kinds of readings into that. So maybe it sort of embellishes um, the, these things and enlarges rather than sort of destroys. Um, the very first issue of Loud Paper was on maps. It had five pieces in it. It had one essay by myself and then um, some music reviews, a, um, some drawings uh, that were came at drawings, a poem, which it actually later never had poetry after that. Um, but uh, it had, um, that actually all came from a call from the first poster that you saw. So. Um, even from the very first issue, it was collective and sort of decidedly so. Um, the second issue was uh, called Take Me to the Fair. It was on the World's Fair in Queens um, and had a, for an essay on that by me and then a variety of other sort of fair-like things. Um, issue three was on Elvis. No, it was on Vegas. Um, <laughs> And Chance, uh, my favorite essay from that was uh, an essay on uh, Gordon Maddox Clark uh, that came out. And then again, each time this were all collective, uh, had various contributors, ha um, always had music reviews. Um, later issues had other things like um, advertising from MIT Press or advertising from Discord Records, um, larger interviews with artists um, and writers. Um, so sort of with each one, they began to evolve. Um, I brought in editors probably from like the fourth issue on. I had various co-editors on it. So we began, you know, sort of working together and shaping the content. talk about community as being something that um, is, is a little um, baseless, it's a little nameless, it's not very, um, it's, it's very hard to predict it. And um, I'm, I'm wondering what uh, each of your projects, are you
are you, especially with the internet, say with hashtagging or with selective criticism, are you interested in talking to a large community or do you have specific audiences and who are these audiences that you're speaking to in relationship to each one of your projects? Hmm. Well, I think I always really go back to that first um, loud paper quote, which is about, you know, sort of, Dear John's students, um, uh, Girls About Town, <laughs> um, as, as an aspirational community for me, um, one that sort of has a resonance outside of um, simply talking to architects. Um, and, uh, you know, I, I use the word commons um, in relationship to a hashtag as sort of a a place rather than community um, in order to sort of escape sort of the internet culture of like community manager um, and that there's these sort of uh, sites that sort of monitor activity as you know sort of on bulk and sort of uh, data streams and things like that. Um, it, the, the comments is sort of a ground sort of when a, when a certain issue happens and then people sort of like chime in on that. So I, the, who, who reads my tweets? Um, I don't know, a couple thousand people out there read my tweets. Um, it's, it's, not, um, it's not necessarily a huge group who read me, um, but I read other people and then, you know, then we all begin to sort of chime in. So I have no metric for you, sorry. Yeah, so he's setting up, you know, Archimed, I understand the title is different then. I guess it's, it's called Pimpin' Architecture, which is kind of funny. Um, but it, it's interesting, so you're kind of in the same kind of cultural context and, and working at the same time. With, same, with same year. Same year. Same year. Yeah. Well, and, I, and I know Paul quite well. <laughs> I, I'm wondering what, to, what, what your decision-making process was, where you were like, I'm, I'm going to go with the analog and kind mm -hmm. of go with the, the zine, pick up the kind of... Uh, like the David Carson kind of aesthetics and go that route rather than trying out this like new thing <laughs> called the web. You know what I mean? Like, um, I think it was, it was skill based. So it, there was always a website for Loud Paper, it just wasn't very good. Um, uh, and there's still loads. At, um, I went zine culture because I was really interested in the distribution models uh, outside of. Um, outside of architecture. So, uh, for instance, I would print about 2,000 copies. Um, those would go to, and, th and this is where the, sort of the tail end of zine culture itself, and those would go to, I'd mail them to a distributor who would send them to record stores and, um, you know, abroad. It's somewhere in Tower Records in, like, Kansas. Um, and so they actually had a kind of network of their own and became sort of a filtering mechanism for people who I ended up working with later. Um, very much a skill-based thing. I wasn't a programmer in 97. Um, and however, I was able to work with various web designers who volunteered their services later to sort of build a more robust archive for it. But, um, you know, I was kind of like a punk kid who wanted to sort of make a zine. Uh, sure. you know. So when, when did you like, when did you kind of uh, transition into like, more of a, a digital um, phase of your, of your own kind of work? Of my own practice? Probably about 2007, 2008. Um, with, you know, really parallel to the kinds of tools that are available um, in social media. Space time in architecture, super slow being 
to sort. Um, however, sort of the beauty of the mess is that you are sort of you do you don't have to go to a single source um, in order to sort of get one opinion. So that you were sort of always sort of coming through multiple opinions at a time. And um, so you have something like say folk MoMA, you have something like Fast Company reporting on this is happening. You have Kimmelman in the Times saying this is a disgrace. Um, you know, you have uh, other folks sort of like uh, Aaron Betsky sort of weighing in on like, well, whether, whether or not this is sort of good for the profession or do we even need an expanded, like what does this mean for MoMA? And in that sense, I think we actually end up not with the death of criticism, but sort of a kind of engorged uh, way to sort of navigate a subject. Um, my hope would be that you know this happens to be a very particular subject, and I think it's very building oriented and sort of kind of has a nostalgia to it all, which is sort of provoking this larger criticism. But I think in looking at sort of the breadth of this, we could actually see potential for uh, you know for for what could be a very rich sort of body of content. Um, however, you know. We've always had different channels of, and even in single magazines, something like you know, Intenza's Art and Architecture, you know, would have criticism, as, you know, as as well as sort of the glossy pictures. So these things have always sort of asked a reader or an audience to sort of make distinctions and sort of got, draw some of their own conclusions.
efficiency or uniqueness? Oh, that's a good one. Um, I'm not really sure how to answer that. And it, I don't, I don't find Twitter efficient. Um, I think you can kind of get a little missive out there, but um, I, I read it as so, it, it's sort of some as sort of layers of things that you're sort of sort of sorting through and having to leap between different things, leap between different conversations. Um, it's more of the mess. Then it is sort of an, a, it's not, it's clearly not a productivity tool. Um, however, the, um, you know, the everyone's a cur, you know, everyone's a critic, everyone's a curator. Um, I think some of what we're seeing is sort of the things that rise quickly are the things that get lots of likes. Um, Twitter has a way of sort of both promoting the, it's a hot stuff, but it kind of, that moves super fast, but then also has room for sort of the slower stuff, the things underneath. And so um, within that mess, you can sort of find the unique, um, especially when you sort of burn off sort of the hot stuff on top um, and sort of troll through it for a while. So in efficient, unique, um, for me, the noise, of Twitter, the sort of the, and the sort of it is remarkable in the sense that um, it reminds me of the kinds of networks of people from wherever, you know, can begin to sort of weigh in. So that proximity is not necessarily given more privilege. Um, so you don't have to be in New York or you don't have to be in LA in order to join this conversation. Uh, you don't have to be in London. Um, but I talk to London on Twitter uh, on a daily basis where I, I listen. Um, and so these kinds of um, a geographical conversations happen and, and speed through some of these issues pretty quickly. All right. Is that it? All right. Thank you. <laughs>